last lecture we were looking at uh, the simple harmonic oscillator and this was in the position representation. So, we will continue with the linear harmonic oscillator, the simple harmonic oscillator. And we realized that uh, the equation to be solved given the Hamiltonian h is p squared by 2 m plus half m omega squared x squared. This is the Hamiltonian and p is to be written as minus i h cross d by d x in the position representation. The equation itself is at psi is equal to e psi that was the time independent Schrodinger equation and therefore, we had minus h cross squared by 2 m d 2 psi of x by d x squared plus half m omega squared x squared psi of x is equal to e psi of x. Of course, we realized that there was a part in general which was a function of time and that was not the time independent Schrodinger equation. Uh, we had taken the, the Schrodinger equation and written the wave function as some psi of x chi of t and then of course, this was the part that depends on x and chi of t itself had a solution e to the minus i e t by h cross and that is how you define a stationary state because then the uh, expectation values do not change in time and uh, mod psi squared again does not change in time and so on. So, we are really looking at stationary state problem solutions to the stationary state wave function in the position representation. And since we have already worked out the harmonic oscillator problem using the abstract operator method A and A dagger and the commutation algebra commutator A dagger is identity, we can now do it in the position representation uh, draw parallels between what we got in the abstract operator method and what we will be getting here in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So, we got to a point where I wanted to write this in a more convenient form and therefore, we had d 2 psi by d x squared if I suppress the index x. <coughs> minus m squared omega squared x squared by h cross squared psi of x okay, is minus 2 m e by h cross squared psi of x. Then I said let us define alpha as root of m omega by h cross and then indeed this becomes d 2 psi by d x squared minus alpha to the 4 x squared psi of x is minus 2 m e by h cross squared psi of x. Now, we would like to work in terms of dimensionless quantities. So, I can identify a length scale in this problem. You see this object has dimensions of inverse length that is the dimension and therefore, if I define an object rho which is alpha x rho is a dimensionless quantity and then we can recast this equation in terms of rho for d 2 psi by d x squared would become alpha squared d 2 psi of rho now by d rho squared minus alpha to the 4 x squared but then you see if I bring down this alpha squared I get a minus rho squared here psi of x is minus 2 m e by h cross squared alpha squared psi of x. This object 2 m e by h cross squared alpha squared is again a dimensionless quantity. I define lambda as 2 m e by h cross squared alpha squared. And since alpha was root of m omega by h cross and therefore, I have an m omega by h cross here and so this quantity is 2 e by h cross omega. 
and that is very nice because now I have an equation in terms of objects which do not have dimensions. I will comment on this shortly, but I now have d 2 psi of rho by d rho squared minus rho squared psi of rho is minus lambda psi of rho and therefore, I have d 2 psi by d rho squared plus lambda minus rho squared psi of rho equals 0. What is it that we did in the abstract operator formalism, which was the parallel of what I have done now? I have now written, I have now uh, written things in terms of dimensionless quantities. I have introduced a rho which is dimensionless, because alpha had the dimensions of inverse length and therefore, alpha x was dimensionless. The equation itself is cast in terms of dimensionless quantities like rho and lambda. Now, you will recall that when we did the abstract operator method in terms of a and a dagger, the ladder operators, we said that x was root of h cross by m omega a plus a dagger by root 2 and p was root of m omega h cross a minus a dagger by root 2 i. This has dimensions of length and this has dimensions of momentum and therefore, a and a dagger themselves were dimensionless quantities. So, when we worked in the abstract operator formalism, we worked with a and a dagger and wrote the Hamiltonian as a dagger a plus half h cross omega. And then, when I have an equation like h ket n is e sub n ket n, where n is the state of the uh, oscillator and e sub n is the corresponding energy eigenvalue. That is the same as saying a dagger a plus half h cross omega acting on the state n is e sub n ket n. That equation again is in terms of objects which are dimensionless, a and a dagger are dimensionless quantities. I have scaled out an h cross omega. So, I might as well just pull that out and say a dagger a plus half ket n is e in units of h cross omega ket n and if I forget the half as well for the moment, I have a dagger a n is n ket n, where I realize that e sub n is n plus half h cross omega, where n is an integer and since I have removed the half h cross omega, I have this. So, you see this equation that we wrote when we worked out the harmonic oscillator problem using the abstract operator method was an equation in terms of dimensionless quantities. Scaled out the h cross omega, uh, wrote a and a dagger in terms of x and p such that they were dimensionless and then you have this equation. The analog of that is precisely this except that I have written it in the position representation and therefore, I have d by d rho and so on occurring here and rho squared and so on, but the whole thing has been recast in terms of dimensionless quantities. So, it is like writing this equation in the position representation that is what I have done. So, I have psi of rho here. Now, when I solve this equation, <coughs> I first try to find out if I have any solutions for specific values of lambda and that gives me a handle on solving this equation. So, for instance, if lambda is 1, then d 2 psi by d rho squared plus 1 minus rho squared psi equals 0. But you see an equation of this form can be factored and written in a different manner altogether. I have the equation d 2 psi by d rho squared plus 1 minus rho squared psi equals 0 and that can be written as d by d rho minus rho d by d rho plus rho psi equals 0 because this is just d 2 by d rho squared psi minus rho d psi by d rho plus d by d rho of anything that comes after that. So, that is the same as d 2 psi by d rho squared minus rho d psi by d rho plus rho d psi by d rho and that cancels out 
<coughs> plus psi and then I have a minus rho squared psi. So, and that gives me a plus 1 minus rho squared. So, which is what I have here. Therefore, the solution of this equation could well be got from this d by d rho plus rho psi equals 0, but that solution is obvious. If d by d rho plus rho psi equals 0, then that implies that psi is a Gaussian in rho. So, d by d rho plus rho psi of rho equals 0 implies psi of rho is e to the minus half rho square. And therefore, that is also a solution of this equation. <coughs> since, since psi is a Gaussian and it satisfies this first order equation, it also satisfies that equation. So, I have a solution, I have a definite solution for lambda equals 1. But I know from whatever I have learnt using the abstract operator method that there is a Gaussian solution for the equation a on ket 0 is 0. You see then we wrote a in terms of x and p, wrote p in terms of uh, in the position representation as minus i h cross d by d x and then we got the Gaussian solution because if I had started there and I had substituted for a here from this if I solve for a I simply have root 2 x let us let us write down a in terms of x and p. <coughs> so, I have root 2 x equals root of h cross by m omega a plus a dagger and therefore, I have root of 2 m omega by root of h cross x is equal to a plus a dagger. Then I have an i p again with a root 2 and on this side I had a root of m omega h cross and therefore, root of 2 by m omega h cross i p is a minus a dagger which gives me a I can solve for a and I have a is equal to <coughs> root of m omega by h cross x plus i p by root of m omega h cross but that was 2 a and therefore, I have all this divided by 2. So, I have a is equal to 1 by root 2 times this object and that is fine because uh, I have again made it dimensionless apart from the 1 by root 2 which I need to put in. So, now in the position representation how does this equation look? a on ket 0 is equal to 0 looks like this. In the position representation let me write this as uh, psi 0 of x <coughs> and a itself can be written in terms of x. So, essentially I am trying to say that root of m omega by h cross x plus i p by root of m omega h cross acting on psi 0 of x is 0 and that means, but root of m omega by h cross is alpha. So, I have alpha x plus i by root of m omega h cross p is minus i h cross d by d x psi 0 of x equals 0. So, I have alpha x plus root of h cross by m omega d by d x psi 0 of x equals 0. That is the same as saying that gave me an alpha downstairs. So, 1 by alpha d by d x plus alpha x psi 0 of x equals 0. In terms of rho which is alpha x that is simply d by d rho plus rho psi 0 of x equals 0 which is exactly what I have here. So, it is good to draw a parallel and understand how exactly the abstract operator method when written in the position representation will give me this. I started with writing a ket 0 is 0, but if a is written in terms of x and p 
and p itself is minus i h cross d by dx. I simply get that equation with the solution which is a Gaussian solution. So that is one thing that I have learnt that for a specific value of lambda, lambda is equal to 1, the solution is Gaussian and then by inspection I see the following. Go back to the general equation. Let me look at the asymptotic form of psi of rho because I know that it has to satisfy boundary conditions. The wave function has to vanish sufficiently fast, has to go sufficiently fast to 0 at spatial infinity that is as rho goes to plus minus infinity. But when rho goes to plus minus infinity this object overpowers this and really the value of lambda becomes immaterial. So in order to study asymptotic behavior, that is as rho goes to plus minus infinity. I might well take lambda to be 1 and if I did that I can see that psi of rho should go as e to the minus rho squared by 2 apart from other functions of rho. I will call it u of rho. The dominant behavior uh, for rho going to large values is e to the minus rho squared by 2 goes as e to the minus rho squared by 2 and uh, that is all that I needed to know. Now I can substitute this for psi, this solution for psi, recast the differential equation as a differential equation for u, find out u and then I know the full solution, the wave function for the simple harmonic oscillator in the position representation. So that means the following, let me write psi of rho as e to the minus rho squared by 2 u of rho. So that means d psi by d rho is u prime of rho, first derivative of u with respect to rho. That is psi prime but I need psi double prime of rho that is a u double prime of rho I am now going to have a second order equation in u that is what I have from the first term. So this is what I have for d2 psi by d rho squared and then I substitute it back there. I am going to have an equation which involves u double prime and u prime both of them. I have a minus rho e to the minus rho squared by 2 u prime of rho and the same thing out here. So that gives me a minus 2 rho and therefore I have the equation itself becomes d2 psi by d rho squared gives me u double prime of rho. I am going to pull out an e to the minus rho squared by 2 that is a common thing in all of them and the asymptotics are dictated by e to the minus rho squared by 2. So that is u double prime of rho minus 2 rho u prime of rho. So I have taken care of these terms <coughs> and then I have plus rho squared e to the minus rho squared by 2 u of rho and then I have minus rho squared e to the minus rho squared by 2 u of rho. So there is a cancellation there. And then of course I have lambda, so I have out here <coughs> plus lambda psi of rho and I have pulled out an e to the minus rho squared by 2 therefore I have a lambda u of rho that is there. So I have already taken care of all these terms except this one which is a minus u of rho. So this object is equal to 0. So let me write this in a convenient fashion. I have u double prime of rho minus 2 rho u prime of rho plus lambda minus 1 u of rho equals 0. So this is the equation for u second order equation which needs to be solved 
once I solve for u, I can put that back in psi of rho, uh, just multiply it with the Gaussian e to the minus rho squared by 2, normalize it suitably so that the wave function uh, obeys the probabilistic interpretation, it is normalized to unity and then I have my answer. But you see, to solve this equation, I will use uh, the fact that u of rho, it is we are now working in function space. I will use the fact that u of rho can be expanded in terms of polynomials of rho. I can write it as a polynomial of rho. So, therefore, u of rho, let me try this solution. It is a summation over <coughs> C s rho to the power of s. Again, I am interested in the asymptotic behavior. So, definitely I need to worry about s taking large values and s could perhaps take all values. So, let me say s starts from nu c s rho to the power of s, some value nu does not matter the small values, I am worried about the asymptotic value. So, let me substitute that there and therefore, I have summation over s c s. Uh, so, u prime of rho is summation over s c s s rho to the s minus 1, which gives me u double prime of rho is equal to summation over s c s s times s minus 1 rho to the s minus 2. Now, substitute this, I will keep this for later perhaps. So, when I substitute this back, I have summation over s c s s times s minus 1 rho to the s minus 2, that is what I have for u double prime minus 2 rho u prime, u prime is simply summation over s c s s times rho to the s minus 1 plus lambda minus 1 u that is equal to 0. So, now here if indeed this should uh, give me 0, it is clear that every power of rho the coefficients corresponding to every power of rho should vanish. So, let us compare, let us let us write down the coefficient of rho to the power of s. So, for that let me redo the first term, call s minus 2 s p. So, it is summation over p suitable summation, I am only interested in the asymptotic value. So, when s goes to infinity p also covers go all the goes all the way to infinity. So, that is p plus 2, <coughs> s is p plus 2. So, s minus 1 is p plus 1. rho to the power of p that is the first term and I can go back to calling p as s because that is summed over that is just a dummy index. That is my first term minus 2 summation over s c s s rho to the power of s. So, I am just trying to pull out coefficients of rho to the s plus lambda minus 1 summation over s c s rho to the s is 0. And therefore, I have C s plus 2 for any s, C s plus 2 times s plus 2 s plus 1 is equal to 2 C s s plus lambda minus 1 C s. Therefore, C s plus 2 by C s is 2 s plus lambda minus 1 divided by s plus 2 times s plus 1. Now, this is a good thing to know because we are interested in what happens for large values of s. <coughs> the asymptotic behavior is going to be dicta dictated by this ratio and one wants to see if uh, the series converges at all. So, let us look at this ratio. For large s, This ratio was as 2 by s because I have a 2 s that is negligible compared to that for large s. And here I have an s squared that is a leading term and therefore, I get an s by s squared. It is a 1 by s. So, for large s this goes as 2 by s. But I know of another series, I am now trying to find out um, the solution for u of rho as a function of rho. 
I know of a series which for large s has this asymptotic behavior and that is unfortunately the series solution for e to the rho squared. If I expand e to the rho squared, so maybe it is good to put down this equation somewhere uh, d 2 psi by d rho squared plus lambda minus rho squared psi equals 0. <coughs> And lambda was 2 e by h cross omega and rho was alpha x. Alpha itself was root of m omega by h cross. So, there we are. So, if you look at the series e to the rho squared, <coughs> let us write this as summation over c as rho to the power of s. You find that for large s, it goes as 1 by s. And that is very unfortunate as it stands, because that is like telling me that u of rho is essentially e to the rho squared. And therefore, psi of rho is e to the rho squared times e to the minus rho squared by 2, which I guessed uh, from the asymptotic form when lambda was 1. And this is therefore, e to the rho squared by 2, which is unfortunate, because for large rho, it blows up. But I want psi of rho to go to 0 as rho goes to infinity. So, I cannot let terms for large s survive in the series, if at all I hope to get a solution. So, the only way to handle this is if the series truncates at some point, so that um, the coefficients corresponding to large s simply do not contribute. Some value of s where the series truncates and therefore, the summation over s does not go all the way to infinity, but gets stopped somewhere else, somewhere at a lower value, at a finite value. And if that happens, then clearly I do not have to worry about the asymptotic behavior and uh, predict that to be e to the rho squared. So, let us see how exactly this series will truncate. I do not want that. So, one way of solving the problem is to look out if the series uh, truncates somewhere. And that is possible, because if 2 s is equal to lambda minus 1, <coughs> oh this is 2 s minus lambda minus 1 here. If 2 s is equal to lambda minus 1, then I know that the series truncates. But since s is an integer, lambda must be equal to 2 n plus 1, where n is an integer, positive integer. And then, if s is equal to n, the series, when s is equal to n, the series truncates. So, the summation over s goes from uh, uh, the lower value, whatever it is, all the way to n where lambda is 2 n plus 1, where n is an integer, positive integer. So, that is the possible way of handling this problem and indeed that is the correct way of doing it. But if lambda is equal to 2 n plus 1, go back to the definition of E. E is h cross omega by 2 times lambda. So, E is n plus half h cross omega. So, you see this is very intimately uh, connected with each other. The fact that the asymptotic behavior of psi should be admissible, the fact that psi should go to 0 um, for large rho, for large uh, uh, values of uh, rho and therefore x, puts a constraint on lambda, <coughs> because the series has to truncate. And that in turn tells me what the eigenvalues are. So, the eigenvalues are of the form n plus half h cross omega and in principle n can be 0, 1, 2, 3 anything. And when n is equal to 0, it tells me that lambda is equal to 1 and that is the lowest value that n can take, because s has to take positive values. So, lambda is equal to 1 really corresponds to the ground state of the oscillator 
and indeed we saw that the ground state of the oscillator the wave function in the position representation is a Gaussian wave function and, and that is how things get linked up with each other. In any case going back here suppose there is some value of n where the series truncates that is very nice because then u of rho is simply summation over s all the way to n c is rho to the power of s and that is it. So, c n is not equal to 0, but c n plus 1 etcetera are 0. It is a finite series. Now, look back at this and if I do that what kind of equation do I have here? <coughs> this equation is essentially the same as the equation satisfied by the Hermite polynomials, because the equation for the Hermite polynomials is like this. Suppose h n of rho is the Hermite polynomials, the solution of the equation h n double prime of rho minus 2 rho h n prime of rho plus 2 n h n of rho equals 0 is the Hermite differential equation. These are polynomials in rho, h n of rho is a polynomial in rho. I briefly mentioned the properties of h n of rho in an earlier lecture, said that in function space they could form a basis. The function space that we are considering here for the harmonic oscillator problem is clearly L 2 minus infinity infinity because rho takes values minus infinity infinity. So, u of rho the solution for u of rho is essentially h n of rho apart from some normalization constant and therefore, u of rho is some normalization h n of rho and therefore, I would like to call this u n of rho lambda itself is 2 n plus 1 and therefore, the n is brought in here. So, we could well write u n of rho minus 2 rho u n prime of rho and a u n of rho there. This lambda ok. So, that is what I have. So, this is some normalization which I have called uh, I could well call it n h n of rho and clearly the normalization would would have a 1 by root pi 2 to the power of n n factorial to the half from the orthonormality property for h n which I just now wrote and therefore, this is what I should be having for u n of rho. I need u n of x and since rho is equal to alpha x u n of x is alpha by root pi 2 to the power of n n factorial to the power of half h n of x. So, this is what I have and this is normalized to unity the u n's form an orthonormal basis uh, set of functions, but now going back to psi I now write psi n of x because for a given value of n and therefore lambda and therefore e I have a certain wave function and that is given by this object u n of rho which is essentially h n. So, let me not write the normalization to some normalization n h n of x times the Gaussian e to the minus x squared by 2. The Gaussian takes care of the fact that the wave function goes to 0 sufficiently fast at infinity space infinity. The h n of x themselves arose um, because the series had to be truncated in order that the wave function was an admissible wave function. Not every wave function which is square integrable can be a solution to our problem. It is only those wave functions which satisfy the boundary conditions 
imposed by the physical requirement of uh, the probabilistic interpretation that wave functions must be normalized to 1 and therefore the probability of seeing the system um, in the given region of space is 1. It is that that is going to bring out an h n of x here and therefore I have eigen functions of the oscillator given by psi n of x with the energy eigen values given by n plus half h cross omega. So, in this method of uh, working out uh, eigen values and eigen functions, <coughs> there are some crucial points which are worth noting and which we will be using in subsequent problems that we will consider. Wherever possible, we will go to dimensionless variables. In this case, we went to rho and lambda, where rho itself uh, did not have the dimensions of length, x did and alpha had dimensions of 1 by length and therefore, rho was dimensionless. Similarly, lambda did not have dimensions because lambda was e by h cross omega, 2 e by h cross omega. So, we will do that always and that as I said uh, connects up with the abstract operator method because we wrote that in terms of a's and a daggers which were dimensionless objects. In fact, I had explicitly illustrated that a on ket 0 is equal to 0 really turned out to be the differential equation with lambda set equal to 1 here in the case of uh, uh, the position representation. These are the wave functions, but I know that these wave functions must have definite parity. I know this because of uh, an earlier argument that I had given that the Hamiltonian for the harmonic oscillator for the one dimensional oscillator commutes with the parity operator and from that I had earlier shown that the wave functions would have definite parity. The eigenstates of the Hamiltonian would have definite parity either positive parity or negative parity and that there is a complete set of common eigenstates of the parity operator and the Hamiltonian. Now, that you can verify right here because the h n's can be written in the following fashion. h 0 of x is 1, h 1 of x is 2 x, h 2 of x uh, okay, is 4 x squared minus 2. So, you see this has odd parity, this has even parity, that has even parity and so on. e to the minus x squared by 2 anyway has, is an even parity state when x goes to minus x e to the minus x squared by 2 does not change sign and therefore, these wave functions have a definite parity. It is clear that psi 0 of x, uh, psi 0 of x, psi 2 of x and so on are even parity states. That means, psi 0 of minus x is plus psi 0 of x and so on and psi 1 of x psi 3 of x, psi 5 of x are odd parity states. That means, psi 1 of x is minus psi 1 of minus x or psi 1 of minus x is minus psi 1 of x and so on. This property is reflected by the fact that psi n of x is essentially h n of x and the h n's themselves have even and odd parity like I have shown here. Now, if you look at the wave function uh, and have a schematic plot of these wave functions as a function of x, you can schematically see the following. So, if you take psi 0 of x, remember that this is the same in my notation as x 0, where a on ket 0 was 0. This written in the position representation is psi 0 of x and if I plot psi 0 of x versus x get a Gaussian in x centered at x is equal to 0. Then if you look at psi 1 of x, and psi 1 of x is x 1 in my notation when n takes a value 1.
goes to 0 at infinity, goes to 0 at plus infinity and minus infinity, but that is anti symmetric, that is an anti symmetric function of x and therefore, you can see that it has odd parity. <coughs> Look at the number of times it cuts the axis, psi 0 of x does not cut the axis, it just goes all the way to plus minus infinity. Uh, there is no finite value of x where the wave function vanishes as far as psi 0 of x is concerned. As far as psi 1 of x is concerned, it has one point where it vanishes, it is a node, a node is a point where the wave function vanishes. Now, look at uh, psi 2 of x, that is an even parity state, that is an even parity state. The wave function goes to 0 at space infinity, it is a symmetric wave function, cuts the axis at 2 points. These are the nodes. This in my notation is x, n is equal to 2. Quantum optics, I would call it the 2 photon state. I have written the 2 photon state in the x representation. If I were talking in the language of quantum optics, the case of the simple harmonic oscillator, I would simply say that it is the second excited state of the oscillator. <coughs> so, we have this. Now, the number of nodes is increasing. The ground state had 0 nodes. The first excited state of the oscillator has 1 node. The second excited state has 2 nodes and so on. And why does the number of nodes increase with energy? Now, that is something that we can see rather easily because in general the number of nodes would increase with energy for the following reason. Uh, the contribution to the Hamiltonian comes from p squared by 2 m and uh, therefore, <coughs> I have p psi, p psi star. I am trying to find out the expectation value of energy, the contribution from the kinetic energy. Since that had a p squared by 2 m and I can pull out the 1 by 2 m, I would just have p psi star p psi and this is all a function of x and therefore, I have dx, where I have psi of x and p itself is minus i h cross d by dx. So, the expectation value of energy is integral minus infinity to infinity minus i h cross d psi by dx star minus i h cross d psi by d x d x, but that apart from constants involves a gradient operator. So, that is essentially an integral over grad psi mod square d x. And since the gradient operator uh, adds to the energy, the more the gradients, the more the number of times you have to go up and down, there is an increase in energy. And every time you cross a node, you go down, you go up, whereas here that does not happen. Here you go up once, here you go up twice and so on. Therefore, as the uh, number of nodes increases, there is more work done. The gradient operator uh, brings in a larger contribution and therefore, the energy levels, as the energy levels increase, you find that the number of nodes increases. In the case of the oscillator problem, the number of nodes increases by 1, um, uh, the, the nth excited state of the oscillator has n nodes. That means, it cuts the x axis, the wave function cuts the x axis n times and that is what you see here. There is a last point that I want to make before I close this lecture to connect up the operator method, the abstract operator method that we had with whatever we have written here. We know that in the abstract operator method, we had shown this. Barring constants, it is clear that a on ket n is essentially ket n minus 1. So, let us see if this is really true. I know that psi 0 of x that is that corresponds to ket 0 is e to the minus x squared by 2, it is a Gaussian. And then there is a normalization uh, which I which will forget for the moment, but it is essentially a Gaussian. And then psi 1 of x 
is the Hermit polynomial h 1 of x which is 2 x e to the minus x squared by 2. <coughs> that is again apart from normalizations. So, let us see if a in the position representation acting on psi 1 really gets it to psi 0 of x. So, a you will recall is d by d x d by d rho plus rho and this is supposed to act on on this object. So, let us let us worry about d by d x plus x acting on psi 1 of x. This quantity let us evaluate this. That is the analog of A on ket 1. Of course, I am forgetting constants, I am just trying to see the general pattern. So, that is e to the minus x squared by 2 plus <coughs> minus x squared e to the minus x squared by 2 plus x squared e to the minus x squared by 2 and that gives me the Gaussian. So, you see a on ket 1 is essentially ket 0, the essentially because I have not put down the constants, this is good enough for me to see it. Similarly, if you look at a dagger on ket 0, you can check that that gives me ket 1. In other words, a dagger acting on e to the minus in the position representation acting on e to the minus x squared by 2 takes it to x e to the minus x squared by 2 and that is what you have plotted here. This is e to the minus x squared by 2 schematically, this is x e to the minus x squared by 2 and so on. So, uh, we have checked therefore, that the that the operator formalism exactly matches with the position representation formalism of the harmonic oscillator problem. Now, it is a matter of convenience. If all we need are the energy eigenvalues and the energy eigenfunctions, we could well work with the operator method provided we are not interested in the position, provided we are not interested in the manner in which the oscillator oscillates in time, what are the instantaneous values of position and so on. If that is a matter of interest to us, then it is more convenient to write things in terms of the position representation. Otherwise, all these results could have been got perhaps with less uh, work in some sense if we use the abstract operator formalism. And now, we have established that both of them are equivalent methods of solving the same problem. In the position representation, the energy eigenstates of the oscillator, the Hilbert space is a separable space. So, the enumerable infinity of eigenstates and each one of them happens to be representable essentially as Hermite polynomials, appropriate Hermite polynomials protected with a Gaussian suitably normalized. That is a wave function in the position representation and uh, the corresponding eigenvalues of course, are n plus half h cross omega, where n takes values 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. <coughs>